Welcome to lecture 36, 10.1, the language of hypothesis testing. Wow, we're nearing the end of the book, only a few more weeks. Okay, so for the first example, a friend of yours wants to play a simple coin flipping game. If the t coin comes up as heads, you win, and if it comes up as tails, your friend wins. Now suppose the outcome of five plays of the game is tails, 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 tails. Is your friend cheating? Okay, so to figure out whether or not a friend would be cheating, we want to figure out what the likelihood of obtaining five tails in a row is. Okay, so if we found out that the likelihood of obtaining five tails in a row is pretty high, then we would say, oh, he's not cheating, it, it just happened that way. But if the likelihood of attaining, obtaining a tails five times is a very small likelihood, we would might assume that they're cheating. Okay, so this is kind of the premise we're going with. We're going to see how likely is it that we could see this happen in life? All right, so to do this, we're going to go ahead and get a look at the probability. So probability of, let me go ahead and change, or get my pen ready here. Probability of five tails in a row. And they're all independent, so we can go ahead and just multiply the probabilities together. So probability of tails, and we're going to do this five times. And what is the probability of getting a tails? Well, remember, you have either heads or tails, so it's just one out of two. Which means we'll do one out of two times itself five times, which will end up just being one out of two to the fifth power. And then that, after we plug it into our calculator, is about 0 0.0315. So how would we translate this? Let's go ahead and look at the side. So some scratch work here. Remember, I always kind of turn this into a fraction. So this going rounds out to be about 0 0.03. Let's go ahead and do that. Then this is about 3 out of 100. So if we flipped a fair coin five times, a hundred different times, what are we finding? Well, we would expect about three of those trials to result in all tails. So only about three out of 100 trials would be expected to be all tails. This is a very small probability. Okay, so it's possible, but not likely. So we could either assume that our friend is cheating, or we could assume maybe they're not cheating, just having to be super, super lucky. But if they're cheating, they might be using, let's say, a coin that's not fair, which might be weighted on one side or something. So we can assume, or could, let's go ahead with could. We could assume assume our friend is very lucky or cheating. And more than likely, <laughs> it might err on the side of cheating. But it's possible to end up with tails five times. Three out of 100 trials could have that happen. So now let's take a look at what we're going to be calling the null and alternative hypothesis. So by definition, in statistics, a hypothesis is a statement regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. Okay, so one thing to note, we're only going to be looking at one parameter in chapter 10 for hypothesis testing. So now moving on. For hypothesis testing, this is based on sample evidence and probability, and used to test the statements regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. So a hypothesis is a, is a testing procedure based on sample evidence and probability used to test the statements regarding a characteristic, just kind of like what we did with the heads or tails question. We looked at a sample, we computed the probability of finding that sample, and we said, you know what, this looks like a pretty low probability. Very similar concept. So the steps in hypothesis testing. Well, you're going to make a statement. State, let me rewrite that, spelt that one wrong. Statement. 
make a statement regarding the nature of the population. Then the second step would be to collect evidence or sample data to test the statement. And third, we're going to analyze the data to assess the plausibility of the statement. So kind of like what we did with the tails. We had the sample data, all five tails, and then we try to figure out are they cheating or not, and then we analyze the data to assess how possible was it that our friend could get five tails. Now let's look at another definition. This is something called the null hypothesis, denoted H sub zero red H naught, so H naught, is a statement to be tested. Just like how we were saying, is our friend cheating or not? Let's go ahead and assume they're not cheating, right? So that would be a null hypothesis. And then the null hypothesis is a statement of no change, no effect, or no difference, and is assumed true until evidence indicates otherwise. Just like we might say, um, innocent until proven guilty. So we assumed that our friend was not cheating, and we calculated it assuming it was a fair probability or a fair coin. Okay, that's why we did exactly 50% probability of that coin being flipped. If he had been cheating, he probably would have been using a weighted coin, which means it wouldn't have been a fair probability. So that's why we're looking at a null hypothesis. This is a, it would be a fair statement. There's no sort of overleaning. And then we have something else. It's called the alternative hypothesis, denoted H1, which is a statement we are trying to find evidence to support. For example, maybe we're trying to find evidence that our friend is cheating. Okay, that would be our alternative hypothesis. It'd be that he's cheating, and this is not a normal probability to find five tails in just five flips. Now, there are three ways in 10.1 that we can set up our null and alternative hypothesis. So we could have an equal hypothesis versus a not equal hypothesis, which is considered a two-tailed test. So H not, and then we're looking at our parameter, which either might be maybe mu or maybe standard deviation, something like that. We're looking at one of those variables. And then this will be equal to some number value. Then we would go ahead and put down our alternative hypothesis, H1. Once again, we'd state a parameter. And then we would do not equal to some value. So, if I was to make an example of this from our coin toss, we would say H naught would be the tails, so let's say the probability, would be equal to 0 0.5. He was using a fair coin. And then, once again, this is just a sort of basic example. And then H1 might be, well, the probability is not equal to 0 0.5. He's not using a fair die. It's weighted. The probability would be higher for his coin. Okay, that's just sort of a rough basic example on how you might set this up. Why is this called a two-tailed test? Well, if we were to look at a curve, this would be looking at the probability of either being above or below what we're looking for. Now we have something that's called equal versus less than, which is a left-tailed test. So once again, we would have our H naught with the parameter equal to some value. I'm going to go ahead and just copy-paste that down. And then we would have our, oops, real quick, we would have our H1 parameter. But this time it's going to be considered a left tail test, so this would be smaller than some value. Which if I went ahead and graph with a normal curve, would be some less than value. And finally, we'll go ahead and we would have the Still the same H0. Remember, H0 is just if we are looking at this and it was perfectly fair. Okay? There's no change or anything. And then our alternative hypothesis for a right tail would be greater than some value. And remember, these two values are going to be the same for your um, hypothesis, both of them, because you're looking at Either it's this, or it's greater than it, or it's either this, or less than, and so on. And we'd be looking at a curve, ooh, that was not a nice looking curve. We would be looking at a curve for a value greater than. That still wasn't nice, but I'm just going to leave it for now.
so greater than value. All right, so now we're going to create null and alternative hypotheses for the following examples. And we're going to state if it's a right-tailed, left-tailed, or two-tailed test. Once again, key words for these. Right-tailed would be if it's saying it's greater than, right? Just think of the visual aspect of a right-tailed. Left-tailed would be if it's less than. Two-tailed would just be, is it not equal to this value? That's giving us the option of being greater or less than. That's with the two-tailed. You have either option. So let's go ahead and read this. In 2014, the standard deviation of SAT scores on the critical reading test for all students taking the exam was 112. A teacher believes that, due to changes to high school curricula, the standard deviation of SAT scores has decreased. Okay, so let's see, what are we looking at? We're trying to compare two things. One is that, well, this teacher is thinking that she thinks the standard deviation has decreased. But it's possible that it hasn't. So remember, we're going to assume that nothing has changed. So H naught, nothing has changed. And what is the parameter? We're looking for standard deviation. So we're going to use sigma. So what are we looking at? Well, the standard deviation, if nothing has changed, should still just be 112, right? If nothing has changed, it should still be 112. But this teacher is thinking, you know what? I think it's decreased. Okay, decreased. We're thinking of something less than. So that should be a left-tailed test, right? Because she's thinking, you know what? I think it's less than 112. So that would be our H1. Sigma is less than 112. And there we go. We have our null and alternative hypothesis for this problem. Go ahead and try B and C by yourself and check back in with me in a second. OK, let's take a look at B. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 19.6% of children aged 6 to 11 years of age are overweight. A school nurse thinks that the percentage of 6 to 11 year olds who are overweight is different in her school district. Alright, so what are we looking at? Well, there's this statement that children 6 to 11 are overweight, but this nurse thinks there's something different. So the statement is what we're going to go with as H0. So the statement is, okay, and we're looking at a percent. So this is going to be P, right? So P should be equal to 0 0.196. But this teacher, or this school nurse, sorry, thinks that it's different than her school district. So notice she's not saying that it's more or less than. She just thinks it's different. So since it's not more or less than, this is going to be a two-tailed version. We have the option of being more or less than in this problem. And that's just a really rough sketch on the side there. Okay, so H1 is going to be P is not equal to 0 0.196. We have different options. Now let's take a look at the last one. According to popcorn.org, the mean consumption of popcorn annually by Americans is 54 quarts. Wow. Okay, the marketing division of popcorn.org unleashes an aggressive campaign to get Americans to consume even more popcorn. It's amazing to think they still want us to eat more than that. But they want to make money. So let's take a look at this. What is the base amount we're starting with? 50 quart quarts. So that'll be our H naught. And we are talking about, let's see, what is the ah mean? We're looking at mean. OK, so we're going to use u, mu, sorry. So the mean should be equaling 54. And then what is H1, our alternative? Well, we want the mean to be, and it says, even more popcorn, so greater than 54. All right, so that's what we're looking at. We're looking at something to the greater than side. All right, so there we go. Not, not too bad, I think. If you read the words carefully, you can think of greater than and less than. It helps with the visual concept of if you're looking at a right tail, left tail, or two-tailed test. So now... We're going to look at type 1 and type 2 errors. OK, so because we are deciding to reject a null hypothesis or not based on sample data, ooh, what do you know, my green pen? OK. There is the possibility of making an incorrect decision because we're only looking at the sample. We're not looking at the entire population. So because of this, we have four possible outcomes for hypothesis testing. And what are the four outcomes? Well, I'll tell you. Okay, so 
the first outcome, what could happen, is we could reject the null hypothesis. Think back to our flipping the tail. Our null hypothesis for flipping the tail, or sorry, for flipping the coins. So the null hypothesis we said was that the probability was exactly 0.5%. Alternative, we said it was greater. They were cheating. Their coin was not fair. So for our problem, let's say we rejected the null hypothesis, right? We said, you know what? The coin's not fair. And then when the alternative is true. Okay, so in this example, we reject that it's fair, and we're saying, you know what, our friend is cheating. The alternative is true. Now, this decision could be correct. This decision would be correct if it went down this way. But there's another option. Let me go ahead and rewrite our sort of sample. Simple version sample. So the next example, we do not reject the hypothesis. Okay, so we aren't able to reject it when the null hypothesis is true. Now this decision would be correct. The next option would be we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Okay, so we've rejected something that's true. And this decision would be incorrect. If this happens, this is known as a type 1 error. When you reject the hypothesis, or the null hypothesis, when it's true. So for example, let's say we rejected the thought that our friend's coin was fair. But our friend's coin actually was fair. So if we did this, let's say we called the innocent party guilty, this decision would be considered a type 1 error. Now. The next version would be we do not reject the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. So we weren't able to reject this even though our friend was cheating, maybe. Now this decision would be incorrect. And this is called a type 2 error. And here's a small visual for the outcomes. So these are the reality. And then this is our conclusion. Because sadly in life, just thinking of judge systems and so on, the conclusion maybe that judges come to may not always actually be true depending on the, let's see, evidence that is brought forth. Which is sometimes when people go to retrial, new evidence has been found. And that's why maybe their decision in the end is different. So they may have made the wrong decision. Okay, so here's our option. So we do not reject h not, or we do reject h not, And then h not is true. And let's see, h1 is true. This is just a different way to remember. So if we do not reject ho and ho is true, this is correct. If only we had a cheat sheet like this for life, something telling us your decision was correct. All right, so, um. Next option, we reject HO, and it's true. Ooh, that's not good. That's called the type 1 error. That's like sending someone to prison when they're innocent. And then let's see next. So do not reject HO, and H1 is true. So we don't reject the alternative, but the, sorry, we don't reject the null, but the alternative is true, and this is considered a type 2 error. And lastly, we reject the null hypothesis, and h1 is true. So for example, we reject that our friend's coin was fair, and we say, you know what, he was cheating, the probability was greater than zero. So that would be correct. So let's go ahead with that example I've been running with, um, kind of in terms of with the judges. So let's say our null alternative is the defendant is innocent. Okay. And the alternative is the defendant is guilty. We have two outcomes. 
Either the person is innocent or the person is guilty. So if we were looking at a type 1 error, because one of these is a worse error to have happen, type 1 or type 2. So in a type 1 error, we're saying for type 1, we reject HO, so we say we're rejecting that they're innocent, so we reject that they are innocent. And yet, they are innocent. That's the error we've made. So if we reject HO, but HO is true, so we rejected that this person is innocent, yet they actually are, and they go to jail. So we've just sent an innocent person to jail. That's pretty bad for a type 1 error. Now let's say what a type 2 error would look like and see if it's worse. So in a type 2 error, what would happen with that? Well, type 2 error is saying that we do not reject HO and H1 is true. So we do not say that they're innocent and they're guilty. Well, that's not that bad. But we're still setting, we're still letting um, a guilty person go free. So that would kind of be the difference. For type 1 error, we have a innocent person going to jail. And for a type 2 error, we would have a guilty going free. Okay, so that's kind of the slight difference between a type 1 and a type 2 error. So, looking at type 1 and type 2 errors. In 2014, the standard deviation of SAT scores on the critical reading test for all students taking the exam was 112. A teacher believes that, due to the changes to the high school curricula, the standard deviation of SAT math scores has decreased. A hypothesis test is conducted with H0 equal to sigma 112 and H1 sigma is less than 112. What would it mean to make a type 2 error? Well, type 2 error, what is happening with a type 2 error? It's when we're saying that we reject HO even if it's true. So, rejecting HO means we'd take over the alternative. So we would say, we would be saying that the standard deviation is less than 112 when it actually is not. Let me go ahead and fix that standard deviation sigma that does not look that nice. Okay, so that's what would happen there. We'd be saying that it is less than 112 when it's actually not less than 112. Now what would it mean to make a type 2 error? Well, let's take a look at type 2. So type 2 is we don't reject HO and H1 is true. So this would be saying is we would say, we would be saying that sigma is equal to 112 when it is actually greater than 112 or 112. Okay, so once again there is a difference between type 1 error and type 2. Now the probability of making a type 1 or a type 2 error. So similarly to confidence intervals, we can place a probability on the likelihood of making a type 1 or type 2 error. And the notation for it is as follows. So alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error. And notice we use um, Roman numerals for this, so not using an actual 1 and 2. Now the probability of a type 1 error is going to be rejecting H0 when H0 is true. And this guy right here is going to be called, or is called, sorry, beta, like a beta fish. So beta of a type 2 error. What is that going to be? Well, that's going to be not rejecting HO or H0 when H1 is true. Both of them are errors. Okay, so the probability 
of making a type 1 error is decided by the reacher, sorry, the researcher before the sample data are collected, okay? So that should happen before. And as the probability of a type error increases, the probability of a type 2 error decreases and vice versa. Sort of a delicate balance there. All right, so by definition, we have the level of significance alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error. Now, stating conclusions to hypothesis tests. So once you have decided whether or not to reject the null hypothesis, you must state your conclusion. Note, we never accept the null hypothesis. If we don't accept the null, oh, sorry, if we don't reject the null hypothesis, we are saying it could be true. However, we do not have enough evidence to reject our assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So what's a good structure, or what is the structure that I'd like to see for stating the conclusion? All right, so the structure. Because the null hypothesis is, or is not rejected, there is, or is not, sufficient evidence to conclude that, and we insert our alternative hypothesis or our statement. Okay, so for example, we could say, um, maybe for a coin toss, we found out, oh, we can't reject the null hypothesis hypothesis. So you would say, well, because the null hypothesis is not rejected, there's not enough, or there's not sufficient evidence to conclude that my friend was not using a fair die. Something like that. So for stating the conclusion, according to popcorn.org, the mean consumption of pop popcorn annually by Americans is 54 quarts. Ooh, I botched that sentence. All right. The marketing division of popcorn.org unleashes an aggressive campaign to get Americans to consume even more popcorn. We have that the null hypothesis, H0, is mu equal 54 quarts, and the alternative hypothesis, H1, is mu greater than 54 quarts. Suppose that the sample evidence indicates that, and we have two options. One, we find out the null hypothesis is rejected. What will our conclusion be? Well, let's follow the sample. So, because the null hypothesis, and we said it was rejected, is rejected, there is sufficient evidence to conclude. Notice we're not saying it is true, we're saying there is evidence that we can conclude that one thing I forgot to write in the notes here is we're trying to see if after the campaigning they are consuming more than 54 quarts. Okay, so because the null hypothesis is rejected, so it's not equal to 54 quarts, we're going to assume then that the alternative hypothesis is true and that they are consuming more than 54 quarts. So because the null hypothesis is rejected, there's sufficient evidence to conclude that Americans are consuming more than 54 quarts annually, period. Got to throw in that value there. All right, and then, so let's say the null, null hypothesis is not rejected, and what we're going to state the conclusion. Okay, so let's see. So because the null hypothesis is not rejected. There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that Americans are eating a mean of more than 54 quarts annually. 
Remember to throw your um, value inside, so the mean value, the parameter type thing. I kind of forgot that on the part A. That should really be in the sentence. All right, and there we have it. So the two different statements, depending on if our null hypothesis is rejected or is not rejected. Oh, and that is it for this lecture. Please email me if you have any questions on the work.